I first uh, played Angband in 1995 and have been on the dev team since 2010. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, I've been on the dev team since about 2006, 2007, I guess really 2007, and first played it in the, the late 90s and didn't understand it at all. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, probably most of you know what Angband is, but just uh, a refresher. It was a roguelike created in 1990 at the University of Warwick. Uh, it has the reputation, uh, at least historically, as being one of the more punishing classic roguelikes. Uh, maybe deserved, maybe undeserved, but I think that's largely because of its positioning. Uh, we started with Rogue, as you all know, in 1980, and then Moria was Rogue, but more, and Angband was Moria, but more. So we went from 50 levels of Moria to 100 levels of Angband. Uh, the levels don't persist, so there's potentially an infinite amount of stuff, monsters, items, what have you. Uh, unlike some of the other roguelikes, it's less, uh, there, there are fewer tricks that you need to learn in the sense of, oh, this particular combination of things when put together will give you vast power. It's more you just have to keep slowly uh, making your character better, uh, much more through equipment than statistics, but some of both. So there, there's a lot of grind, um, and there's a lot of tactics. There's less strategic uh, long-term play and a lot more just individual battles, uh, things like that. Uh, one of the main things that uh, distinguishes Angband is that because of certain design decisions early on, uh, vari making variants was very easy, and so we have a wide uh, tree of variants that have come about from Angband. So one of our motivations uh, in talking about this particular topic is Angband is a little unusual in that very early on, the original developers left. Uh, not by choice, but basically they graduated. Uh, so as I mentioned, it started in the uni University of, oh, here? Ah. Okay, more? All right. Uh, hello, streaming world. <laughs> so the first creators uh, were at the University of Warwick in 1990, but they actually graduated in 1990, so they left left the game behind to a number of other University of Warwick students. Uh, the first public release was not until 1993, uh, at which point already the, the University of Warwick people had also graduated. So very early on, we had maintainers who were different from the original creators. Uh, so what, what does a maintainer do, really? Uh, well, there are a couple things that you can do. You can fix bugs. You can advance it to more or spread it to more platforms. So it started on Unix, but the very first public maintainer was Charles Swiger, who did PC Angband. So it was very early port to DOS. Um, so you can spread it to more platforms. You can change the game. Uh, now, if you have a very long-lived uh, roguelike, Angband is now 26 years old, then you have people who have played it for 26 years and are very attached to the way it was in 1990 or 1995 or 2000. If you visit the Angband IRC channel, you will find people who say the last good version was in 1997 or 2005 or what have you. So people will really be upset if, they cha if you change their favorite feature. Um, also, unlike other games, if you are the original creator, then you are given a little bit more leeway by the community to make changes uh, that are drastic because it's your vision. Whereas if you are taking over for someone else, people always have the arrow at you that, oh, well, that's not what uh, the original person would have wanted. Um, on the flip side of that, you do have to have, find people to volunteer to do these things. This is not a paid position. Uh, this is done for the love of the game in large part. And most people don't want to just volunteer to go fix bugs all the time. They want to do things, they, they want to make their own mark on the game. So ha having allowance for that is important. And then there's also external drivers of change. So in 1990, no one had smartphones. And now Angman runs on Android. So there are, that, that's not just a platform change, there are also considerations because you have a really small screen. 
So uh, not everything is going to be uh, just open for you. You have to make allowances for that. Uh, Eric? So anyway, so like our talk is really about the last 10 years of development, which is kind of the era that we sort of personally experienced. Um, and so coming in, if you can imagine yourself in, you know, 2005, I guess, you know, during the second tech bubble or something like that, um, you know, what are the kind of big challenges that, that we're facing in Angban? And I would say probably the one that's on foremost in people's minds is this problem of too much junk. Uh, the, the question of how, how many items should there be? What should the balance be? When should they appear? Um, late in the game, especially because the levels regenerate every time you go to them, you never kind of clear them out and they stay cleared out. You clear them out, if you come back, there's all new stuff. So what it means is that by dungeon level 90 something, you've got great equipment. Almost everything you find is probably worse than what you, you had. And so what do you do? I mean, should the game just stop generating that stuff? Should there be a way to like hide it? Should, you know, there was a lot of questions around how that, how, how that should work. Um, similarly, uh, once you've played the game a bunch and you kind of start recognizing some of these important artifacts, uh, there's this question of for replayability, maybe we should be randomizing them. So, so items were, were a big thing people were worried about. Um, there was a new style of play called diving that was kind of su starting to be known. Um, it was very unconventional. People were very confused by it, but uh, the guy Eddie Grove, who kind of popularized it, was really talented, posted these like incredibly short turn counts for Angband. I mean, like under a million turns was considered like a really pretty fast win at the time, you know, like kind of surprisingly fast, and people just didn't really understand how he could do that. And so there's these, these um, after adventure reports written up to kind of explain the strategy. Um, there's also just generally like balance questions, sort of like the last talk, you know, there's always gonna be these kind of balance issues. Um, and there was a bunch of technical debt, like we had sort of an in incomplete version of the Lewis scripting language in there. It had a non-free license, which made it like hard to distribute with things like Debian, because they didn't want to distribute, the Angban license wasn't, wasn't uh, free enough. Uh, and also that we had just been seeing, you know, up 10 years of variants doing interesting stuff and people were saying, well, you know, vanilla should be doing some of this. You know, the variants are where a lot, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, but then right at this period, there's sort of an interesting problem, which is that the maintainer for five years, uh, Robert Ruhlman, uh, kind of announced that he was feeling burned out. I mean, as we said, there's these problems of maintainer motivation. You have to stay motivated. After about five years of doing this kind of unpaid work, you know, he, I think he just, you know, needed a break or just wanted to be done. So. He announces he wants to step down, and traditionally, you know, there'd sort of been torch passing where one maintainer, the sort of next maintainer, would sort of almost like start surreptitiously releasing patches or unofficial versions, and then the, the official one would kind of acknowledge that and pass the torch. In this case, that hadn't really been happening. Uh, by, by March of 2006, Julian Lighton is announced as the successor, but he hasn't really done a ton recently. And as we'll see, there's kind of a reason for that. Like, it seems like he had also maybe been on his way out. So there's kind of this. If you take, you know, from Robert's original announcement, there's sort of almost like a year and a half kind of dead zone where nothing's really happening and people aren't sure you know, who is the maintainer, what's going to happen. Um, uh, and it, it, on the scene, someone named Andy Sidwell starts releasing new versions, unofficial new versions, the sort of S series. And, uh, you, but while, he, while there's nothing from the official maintainer, so there's kind of this question, is this a fork or a variant that Andy's doing? Um, but it, it turns out that Julian kind of continues, sort of says, well, either I'll release something before the new year or I'm done, doesn't release anything. And so then uh, this is sort of like the, you know, to the official transition announcement was in March. Nick McConnell basically says, look, Andy said, well, just needs to be the maintainer. Like, just seems like Julian doesn't have time for this. Um, and, and there was really no disagreement by this point. It had been, a, you know, about a year and a half or two years since anyone had really seen, seen activity. So sort of by fiat, uh, Andy Sidwell becomes the new maintainer. And so the, one of the first things they decide to do uh, is actually create a dev team. So before this, Angban didn't really have a dev team. I mean, NetHack, you know, obviously has a very famous dev team. Uh, in Angband, it had traditionally been kind of like a benevolent dictator, not for life, but, you know, for, for a term at least, who kind of made all the decisions and chose which patches to apply or not. Um, but Andy, I think, coming kind of from the open source world, you know, really wanted to have more collaborators, kind of more more people involved. And so they did a bunch of, I think, really important stuff to kind of keep Angband alive, which was creating, you know, a public issue tracker, public version control, an actual dev team to assist them. So they didn't have to do all the work. They could kind of delegate responsibilities. 
uh, there had been a relicensing effort that they managed to kind of push through to relicense Angband as GPLv2, which I think required contacting like over 100 people. So it was a pretty big effort. Um, and this, I just think this period is basically where we go from kind of a singular vision to sort of a collaborative vision, both in the sense that there's this larger dev team, but also that the community kind of has, has a larger say in what's happening. There's more discussion on forums and my perception anyway is that you know it becomes a lot more a lot more open there's still kind of this unanswered question though which robert uh, i mean alluded to earlier which is what should vanilla angband be we've got 50 variants that you know are steampunk or you know exist in the cthulhu mythos or this or that but what should vanilla angband really be should it kind of be a museum piece that just st stays mostly the same should it radically change and and there's still kind of no answer to that at this point um, so now we'll kind of go into the the changes over the last 10 years to s that the sort of dev team was able to do and some of the kind of challenges around them. So the, the first thing, uh, we aren't using ergonomics here specifically in, in the accessibility context, uh, but some of the changes do overlap with that idea. When we say ergonomics, it's more the comfort of the player in playing, am I still getting picked up? Yeah, okay. uh, the comfort of the player in playing the game uh, and also approachability, how especially new people coming to the game, uh, to make it easier for them to slowly uh, get better at playing the game. Uh, as I said, Angman has something of a reputation for being daunting, uh, and so we want to make that easy without actually making the game easier. Uh, so the first uh, advent was these monster and item lists uh, that you can now bring up on the screen to see what's visible and what's nearby, what you already know about, uh, before, the interface was actually fairly uh, sparse as to what it would give you. Uh, so you have the letters on the screen, but you can't necessarily go look at that red D, uh, you know, five tiles away from you and, and figure out what it is. Uh, you can look, especially if it's not in the room. You may know about it because you detected it, but you don't necessarily know uh, whether it's a small dragon or a big dragon, and that can be very important. Um, the item lists also especially get, uh, help you with like goal setting, basically. So you have once you've detected objects, then you, ha you can figure out where you need to go. Uh, there is a lot more movement towards making the mechanics of the game more transparent, uh, from displaying exactly how much damage you do to a monster, to telling you what your failure rate is going to be if you try to zap a wand, to uh, telling you what the monster's uh, potential spells are. So you still don't know exactly what a monster's spells are going to be when you first meet something, but once you have encountered a monster, then it, a, as you grow, as you encounter it more often, you know, oh, this, this monster casts fireball, this monster will breathe chaos at you, and the, when you look at the monster, the game will actually give you information about the frequency, the potential damage, and so forth. Um, another thing that came up in the accessibility talk was the missile attack convenience commands. So being able to fire uh, not just in cardinal directions, but actually at the nearest monster uh, with one keystroke is very important. Uh, it makes missile attacks roughly as easy to do as melee attacks, which are just bumping into people. Whereas in, in, instead, before you had press star to target, and then manipulate the cursor to where the monster is, and then press T or whatever your key is to fire. So that makes it a lot less cumbersome or less RSI-inducing to play a missile-heavy uh, character. Um, and then there are a few just beginner uh, player improvements, things like the burst screen, which when, when you're choosing your race and your class uh, at the beginning of the game, it actually tells you exactly what your bonuses are or malices for each of the stats uh, when, you, when you begin the game. Uh, there's the option, instead of starting with a pile of money and no equipment, the, the game gives you some sensible starting equipment. And the knowledge menu, uh, I don't exactly remember when that came in, but it's basically, it lets you see at any given point uh, what, what was in your home, even if you're in the dungeon, what was in the stores, even if, in your, even if you're in the dungeon, uh, what are the different flavors of things that you've discovered. So because it's a roguelike, all of the potions and scrolls and so forth have random names, 
uh, and the names don't correspond to the same actual kinds of things like cure light wounds or destruction or what have you each game. So you have to, one of the mini games of Ang Band is ID and learning what the flavors correspond to what types of items there are. And the knowledge menu is a very good way of figuring out exactly what you've, where you've been in that mini game. Uh, we also have some things that are very helpful for development, but also hopefully helpful for the player uh, experience. Basically making the game streamlined without hopefully changing the gameplay experience. So a lot of options that hopefully weren't used uh, got thrown away. Um, this is somewhat controversial because some people, some small number of people still did use them, but at the end of the day, uh, there's only so many things you can test, uh, especially if people, most people aren't using them, so you're not necessarily going to get bug reports if they break. Uh, similarly for old ports, uh, Angband used to run on all sorts of different platforms. It still runs on a wide variety of platforms, but there really aren't that many RISC-OS users anymore, and we can't maintain it if we can't test on it. So a lot of those kinds of things went away. Um, there were many items that were scattered around the dungeon, like uh, just piles of bones that added flavor but didn't really do much for gameplay. And so those also uh, disappeared over time. Uh, much more substantial is that uh, we got rid of haggling in the stores and also charisma. So this is somewhat of a departure from the D&D tradition. But uh, we looked at it and charisma was really not having any sort of meaningful gameplay uh, impact. And it was just a stat that was there that would sometimes get affected if you had a lose stat potion. Uh, so we got rid of Charisma and also prices in the stores were you know, a little bit affected by the removal of haggling, but really it didn't matter all that much. Um, and then the game just looks better now. So there's uh, people, Okay, that may be a, a, up to your opinion, but uh, we had some people in the community contribute some fabulous tile sets that are much uh, more detailed and, well, you go from 8 by 8 to 64 by 64, things get better. Uh, and also UTF-8 for all of the text is now in place, so you can have accented uh, th things that look like the actual Tolkien text, uh, be it accented or, I don't think we're taking advantage of runes yet, but that's a possibility. Um, and also, the, I, I mentioned the game runs on Angband, or Android right now. Uh, there was a port that contribu got contributed uh, six, five, six years ago for Coco. Uh, before that, really, the Mac uh, state of the game was really not that comfortable. Um, and the Coco port is just miles ahead of where we were before. So in that way, lots of, lo lots of uh, new new users can experience a, a much better version of the game. <laughs> so, oh, and there's one other thing that I should mention that uh, didn't get really improved, and that's documentation and testing, because of course no one likes to do documentation and testing. The, even now you still get, if people who are new to the game look around for sort of strategy guides, something called the Angban Newbie Guide uh, pops up, and that's from 1996. Uh, it still has very strict uh, sort of checkpoints as to, okay, you need free, uh, free action by 10,000 feet, or 1,000 feet, you need to have uh, finished stat gain by 1,700 feet, and so forth. So um, just, just as a precursor, you might have assumed that all the previous work was pretty uncontroversial, right? I mean, it seems like, you know, improving the graphics, better stuff, you know, removing haggling, some of these features. No one's going to care. But in fact, people did care even about that stuff. And so the stuff we're getting to now is, is very sort of interesting and controversial, and there's a lot of cool stuff. So I, I alluded earlier to diving, and this is kind of the, um, the slide that kind of describes it in more detail. So traditional Angband gameplay is that you go very slowly and very safely. Like, you know, you're spending potentially millions of game turns, there's 100 levels, any one little mistake, you know, and you're literally going to start over from the beginning, right? So the traditional, the, the prevailing philosophy had been, you know, take zero risks, go very, very slowly, be very safe, 
try and get all the resistances as soon as you can. You know, just do everything you can to minimize danger and, and, and possibly do some of the really boring repetitive strategies that we heard about in the DCSS talk, right? About like scumming, going up and down repeatedly to regenerate new levels at a shallow depth to wait until you randomly get like a good artifact or something. Um, and these are obviously terrible. Like they make the game really boring for people. And the interesting thing with Angband is they actually, we determined that they actually make the game harder in the sense that you kind of learn bad behaviors that later on when you're at dungeon level 89, like none of those behaviors work because it's too dangerous. Like you, you know, the point in the previous talk was made that you have essentially infinite free turns and on shallow dungeon levels at Angband that's true, but at the deep levels, they're so dangerous that you basically, anytime you rest, you could just get, you know, killed in one turn basically. So the strategies you learned at dungeon level 32, you know, or maybe I should say 2000, you know, 2000 feet or whatever, don't work so well you know, closer to the bottom. So anyway, Eddie Grove describes this dri diving strategy which is completely opposite to this. And basically it embraces the danger and says you should just descend as fast as possible because items are so important to the game and you get better items as you go deeper. The, the strategy there is to go as deep as possible, as fast as possible, you know, run away from any monster you aren't sure you can kill. Just try and stay alive. And if you do that long enough, you'll, you'll actually get great equipment and now you're gonna be in a much better position than you would have been kind of using the slow and steady. So this is a case where the rabbit actually does beat the hare in the... Um, the tortoise beats, it does not beat, yeah. Anyway, uh, what, what's going on here later? All right, so anyway, embrace the danger. And then there's a much more emphasis on stealth and avoidance. So the stealth stat, which you know people may be kind of appreciated, but it becomes hugely important to the diving strategy, like really, really important. Um, and one thing that's cool about this play style is that you, because you don't get bored, you don't tend to make dumb mistakes. If you're always on edge, you know, you, at any moment you could die, you tend to play smarter and you develop these like better play habits, which means that when you are in those dangerous dangerous situations at dungeon level 90 something, you've, you've kind of learned the right way to play the game. So uh, it's kind of a high risk, high reward strategy, but um, it, it actually seems like most people who tried it r really liked it. And so we, the dev team didn't really want to like fully embrace and say you have to play this way, but we kind of wanted to encourage people to play this way. It seems like people were having a better time. People who were not, had now had played the game for like a decade and never done very well, were suddenly getting a lot further or, or were able to win, which was pretty awesome. So we introduced some changes that kind of encourage you in this direction. So one example is forced descent, where every time you go back to the dungeon, you go to a deeper level than you were on. There's really no way to decrease your, your, your danger threshold, basically. And that, kind of acts as a timer. So another strategy Angband people did for a long time was go to, you know, slowly go down to dungeon level 98 and then just stay there until you get, you know, the most amazing equipment. And then only when you have a completely risk-free final battle do you go and kill Morgoth and win. Um, Force Descent doesn't really let you do that. Once you get to dungeon level 97, you only have two more levels to go to equipment before you fight Sauron and then one more before you fight Morgoth, and that's it. So it it it, it kind of does encourage you to, to sort of pl to take more advantage of what's going on and not just do this boring play. Similarly, Angband's a lot about inventory management. So we, we sort of have these, these different features around like ensuring that you're kind of using meaningful equipment. Um, I'm just gonna jump ahead here. There's just a whole bunch of other changes we tried to do. So the big problem in Angband is you have these risk-free strategies that are really boring and ha maybe hard to discover. And we tried to make some of those a little bit less risk-free. So Making it harder to find good objects, making object detection fuzzy ends up making, meaning you have to explore the level more. Um, similarly, once you're able to teleport enemies away, you, a really common strategy is to teleport everything away all the time, find the items, and just keep going down. And so we made that a little bit harder to do, um, stuff like that. And we used to have a spell called Globe of Invulnerability that basically completely broke the game. And, and that actually was out even before this time period. But that's kind of another example of a strategy that's just sort of too easy. Um, it seems like we're a little bit behind on slides, so I'll just kind of run through this. But basically, this is the sort of stuff that people really didn't like, these sorts of changes in some cases. But I think that overall, they did make the game more interesting. So we're trying to kind of like ensure that all the classes have an interesting way to play and that like, say, the Ranger class isn't too powerful. For a while, Ranger was super easy. Um, missile weapons are, are less dangerous because the, the enemy's not hitting you it, it's as much. So that becomes like a super powerful strategy. We had to kind of like reduce the effectiveness there a little bit, make melee attacks a little bit more powerful to make up for the fact that it's more dangerous, just sort of stuff like this. Um, and then there was a bunch of stuff to make the levels more interesting. So when you have 100 dungeon levels, it's like a lot. I mean, it's probably too much, but especially if those levels are all the same, it's like really boring by the time you get into like the 60s or 70s. So here we, uh, we tried to make them more interesting uh, with, and with sort of mixed results. Well, we can probably, oh, I have a mic. 
so I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically the things that we've already talked about, uh, the, the community is very attached to uh, its history. So we did get some reaction to a lot of these changes. Uh, there are people who just want it to be, wanted the game to be like it was uh, 10 years ago or 10 years before that time. There are people who didn't necessarily, who realized that these things, that challenges we identified were problems, but disagreed on how to implement uh, the solutions to these problems. Uh, some of them just went off and wrote their own variants. Some already had written their own variants, but uh, there was definitely some pushback there. And then there, there were also people who just said that the game was getting too easy. Uh, these changes that we've made uh, gave, gave the player too many items, uh, the monsters were too easy to dodge, and so forth. Uh, some of this we looked at with simulations to actually figure out, and there was a time where there was actually a lot more uh, item distribution to the player than we had before. So we did try to adjust that to some extent. On the other hand, on the other hand, it seems like mostly people are enjoying it. Um, the, it's hard to get data about this uh, because we don't have like a you know a poll we can do across all the Angvin players. I mean, maybe we, we could build that into the game, but we haven't. And so often you hear from the most vocal people who maybe don't like a particular thing, but actually uh, they they sometimes change their minds. So some some of the veterans have kind of come around, and also there's just lots of people you don't hear from who who like it. So. You know, you, I think even though you often get a little bit pushback in this kind of maintainer situation, it's worth remembering that there's lots of people who are, are enjoying it and, and having a good time. Um, so closing remarks, uh, what can we take away from this? Well, working on a game like Angband, where you're kind of a maintainer rather than like an, an original author, is like kind of difficult but also rewarding. Um, you really do have to balance these things. You can't just have a crazy idea and necessarily do it. Um, but it's fun, and the other thing that's fun is that Angman has a lot of weird stuff, and some of it's really incidental, but then some of it becomes intrinsic to the game, and, and it's hard. I know the original author even probably couldn't predict which of their features were going to be the important ones that made the game really successful. So it's fun to like kind of tease that apart. Like, was the non-persistent level thing just like a hack, or does that actually become like really core to Angman's identity? And, and I think in, in that case, it's the latter. Uh, it is it is just creates a unique play style. Um, but this sort of work is fun, and it's also fun to work with passionate vocal players who have you know. Uh, a lot of insight into how the game's been, how it is now, and where it, kind of where it should go. So it, overall, it's, it's very exciting. And uh, sometimes you get to see something like this. This came on the forums uh, last week, I think. Four days ago. So, so yeah, this is someone who's been playing for over 20 years and finally won, uh, like, last week uh, <laughs> and posted on the forum about it. And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll let you kind of read that for a minute. But then... There's another page which is really fun, which is, so the Forced Descent feature I talked about, they, the, this player specifically called that out as making the game more fun for them, that they said that previously they would have just like agonized forever before doing the final battle, but Forced Descent kind of forced, they, meant that they had a timer, they had to go do it, and then they turned out to win. So that's a situation where I think the feature was, was really successful and kind of worked as intended. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.